Hear the word of God from James chapter 2, verses 1 through 7. My brothers and sisters, believers in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ must not show favoritism. Suppose a man comes into your meeting wearing a gold ring and fine clothes, and a poor man in filthy clothes also comes in. If you show special attention to the man wearing fine clothes and say, here's a good seat for you, but to say to the poor man, you stand there or sit on the floor by my feet, have you not discriminated among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my dear brothers and sisters. Has not God chosen those who are poor in the eyes of the world to be rich in faith and to inherit the kingdom He promised to those who love Him? But you have dishonored the poor. Is it not the rich who are exploiting you? Are they not the ones who are dragging you into court? Are they not the ones who are blaspheming the noble name of Him to whom you belong? May God bless the reading of His Word. Amen. Please be seated. Well, it's this time of the year when time really starts to fly. Exams and papers and things that students have put off from the very beginning are starting to catch up. October is that time of the year where pressure really starts to mount and there is little time left to procrastinate for the procrastinators out there. I know when I was a student, I would always have this conversation with my future self. And I would start to negotiate. And I would say, hey, I really want to watch this football game. And you would want me to watch this football game. So I apologize. I'm going to pass all this work on to you. And of course, my future self would be upset at my past self whenever that time became overwhelming. Maybe I'm the only one that did this. <laughs> I certainly do not envy the students who have all of these deadlines coming up and I imagine this is the time where students are starting to prioritize assignments and they're starting to ask specific questions. Questions like, on what will I be graded? <laughs> or that dreadful question, is this going to be on the test? Forget about that other stuff, I don't want to hear it. Just tell me what's going to be on the test. Uh, this is a, a very natural question to ask. We want to know the standards on which we are going to be evaluated. But in the life of the Christian, in the life of the kingdom of God, if we wish to know what's going to be on the test, if we want to know what we are going to be judged upon at the end, a helpful partner is our brother James. James is a very peculiar preacher. He's peculiar that he speaks very clearly. There are a few passages in the book of James where we're left scratching our heads wondering where James stands on certain positions. And our passage today is no exception. It's here in this passage where we raise our hands and we ask, is this going to be on the test? And James, being the kind professor, tells us, yes, this is the standard on which you're going to be evaluated. And this test question involves the way we receive people in our assembly. And of course, this has implications that go beyond the assembly, but the assembly is a good place to start. Not surprisingly, much of what James says in this passage reflects the life and the teachings of Jesus himself. It doesn't take a working knowledge of Greek or even a close reading of Scripture to get a feel for the position that Jesus takes with respect to this question of who receives honor and privilege in the kingdom of God. In fact, Jesus receives much criticism from the powers that be from his critique of the power structures of society. In a world of haves and have-nots, Jesus, in a living sermon, prefers the company of the weak and the frail and the marginalized, the poor, the forgotten, the nobodies. And then he tells these kingdom stories. And instead of offering up stories of men and women of great renown, Jesus prefers to tell stories about Samaritans and beggars and broken people. These are the people who occupy a place of privilege and honor in the kingdom of heaven. 
But just in case we miss the teachings and the example of Jesus, we have this letter from his half-brother written to the people of the dispersion. Yes, in many ways, James gives us a manual for living out the words of Jesus in the life of the church. And no doubt, taking his cue from, from Jesus, James offers his own critique of the power structures of society and their place in the church. That in the assembly of the redeemed, in the assembly of the broken people, cleansed and empowered by the blood of Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit, there is no place for the kind of power grabbing and name dropping and status assigning that we find in a fallen world. And to receive the wealthy and shun the poor is a road to failing the course. In fact, James calls this type of behavior evil in verse 4 of our passage. The vision we have in the New Testament of the church is a vision of a people who walk out of step with the world and the culture and to give in to this temptation to cater to those with power and with influence is to reinforce those power structures that are created to divide and to separate and to foster jealousy and resentment. Certainly things in opposition to the unity and the shalom of the work of Christ, ushered in by the work of Christ. But James is certainly not writing this in a vacuum. I imagine that wealth privilege certainly is running amok there in his day in the churches. It was a temptation then, just as it is a temptation today. And we as students of the Word and ministers of the Gospel will do well this morning to begin to ask specific questions. Questions like, What's going to be on the test? How do the words of James chapter 2 verses 1 through 7 speak to us today, given our context here in Austin, Texas in 2014? Well, in many ways, we're all responsible for our own answers. We all bring to the table different life experiences. We work among people and among churches with different personalities. We're going to hear this differently depending on our context. But perhaps there are some general guidelines to follow as we prepare for the exam. Although we may hear this passage in different ways, we all hear this against the same background noise of our society. Our society is built around haves and have-nots. That's the way it's always been. The powerful, the strong, the wealthy, the famous, are always going to occupy and maintain a special privilege, place of pr privilege and position no matter how many people line up for an Occupy Wall Street rally they're going to be there. And then there's this strange phenomenon we call celebrity worship. Now in many ways this type of idolatry transcends time and space culture and language but it seems especially potent here in America it's here in this country where we line the streets when we, we wait for the latest pop celebrity to walk by. It's here in America where the latest tweet from Kim Kardashian occupies a, a headline right next to the latest actions of ISIS in Iraq. It's here in this country where we salivate and we bow down to 19-year-olds who can hurl a, an oblong object 50 yards down the field. We are people who are quick to name drop if we've rubbed shoulders with someone of celebrity status. This is the way the world works. And as long as there are people of influence and wealth and power, there will also be a whole host of sycophants and brown nosers and worshipers in the cult of celebrity. And given this landscape, how are we doing in our churches in rejecting this kind of mentality? How are we doing as ministers of the Gospels and student of the Word in receiving this Word and living it out? Well, it may be a good time to visit our subconscious and truly examine our actions and our motives and ask some tough questions. Do we gravitate to the poor, toward the poor and the weak and the frail in our assemblies? Or do we find ourselves lining the streets, hoping to rub shoulders with the powerful and the wealthy and the famous in our church? 
Do we prioritize the hospital list from the most important among us to the least among us? Do the powerful and the influential live rent-free in our thoughts and our hearts whenever we make a decision in the body of believers? Brothers and sisters in Christ, we live in a city of political power and of wealth that is ever flowing and of academia. And James gives us the criteria on which we are to be graded. And there is no time for procrastination in living out the teachings of our Lord. I'm going to end my time here this morning with a story that probably many of us are familiar with, but it has had a profound influence on my thinking about the church and shaping my thinking about ministry. Uh, it's a story that Stan shared in his ministry class years ago, but I think it bears repeating. It's the story of a seminary professor who is teaching a ministry class, and he's taking his class through the ins and outs, the do's and the don'ts of ministry work, and they're reading books. The students are, writing, are reading articles and writing papers on all these different aspects of ministry and life in the church. And then it comes to the end of the course, and the professor offers them a final exam. And this exam is a pass-fail exam, and there's only one question. And the question is this. What is the name of the janitor? What is the name of the janitor that you pass by each and every day on your way to class? It's this type of question on which we are going to be graded. It's this type of question that flows out of passages like James chapter 2, verses 1 through 7. Grace and peace.